You know, one of the things that's so interesting to me about the two passages, even though they're quite a distance apart in the in the novel, is that is that they they start to do something that happens throughout the novel, and that is that there's this carapace of history that's driving this very intimate story and these intimate exchanges all the way through the novel. And so it, it is this sort of fascinating combination of the sweeping epic and very intimate human stories so that, so that, there, that there is plenty of room for real kind of psychological exchange. But within that carapace of history is, of course, the myth of there are many mythologies actually that you're that you're taking on, but the but the first one really that you know that strikes me is is Gallipoli, and mm -hmm. with what it had what it came to mean in terms of defining our Australian identity. And I, I wonder if you could talk a little bit about why that was something that you came to at this moment. Uh, I, I came to this material at this moment because I've been writing these social histories of Australia, which are very interesting because the British used Australia as a dumping ground for deadbeats, not just convicts, but even the dumb sons of the gentry. And we're talking downstairs, <laughs> Dickens sent two sons who weren't good at Latin and algebra, and Anthony Trollope sent a son. And you know, if, if, and if you got them uh, dairy made pregnant, you were sent. Um, and um, if you stole the, the uh, mess funds, then Australia. And, and as I like to quote, uh, importance of being earnest. Um, uh, Jack says to Algernon, the wastrel your uncle said at dinner last night, that you'll have to choose between this world, the next world, and Australia. <laughs> uh, so this, uh, in terms of sex and drugs and rock and roll, Australian social history is fascinating. Even the history of my wife's family, you know, which is part immigrant and part convict. It, it's wonderful history. And on top of that, you've got the oldest culture on earth, the Aboriginal culture, to write about. And the struggle between its struggle to survive once the Martians landed. Uh, and so uh, I, I came to World War I. And you know, as I do, how besotted we are with World War One. We managed to become a nation without bloodshed. And we federated a country uh, as big as London to Moscow plus 200 kilometers, a couple of hundred miles, uh, without bloodshed. And we're kind of ashamed of that bloodless achievement. So we say, Australia was born on the beaches of Gallipoli. Well, Gallipoli is in Turkey. So if Australia was born in Turkey, it's the biggest ectoc ectopic pregnancy in history. Uh, and so I wanted to take on that nonsense, you know. I also wanted to take on that very mythology that one, uh, one Australia is worth, Australian is worth 10 Englishmen. Is that, is that interesting? We've never used that formula. Um, with Americans. We've never said it about Americans. It's always Brits we said it Anyhow, uh, uh, I, I remember when the Americans came to Sydney when I was a kid and, uh, and, and one American was worth 10 Australians because A, they had a sinister degree of politeness <laughs> when they spoke to women and B, they had on top of that gin and nylons. And very nice uniforms. And, and it was Frank Sinatra uniforms, yes. But anyhow, to go back, uh, I wanted to take on that idea because it is true, the Australian soldiers were remarkable. Uh, they were the, it was the army that combined the highest level of going AWOL with the greatest success in, in battle. Uh, and there were 378,000, 380,000 of them from a small country of whom two-thirds were casualties. Mm -hmm. So they were, you know, they, they, in fact, they got rebellious about the fact that they felt they were doing other men's work. Mm -hmm. So obviously they were uh, good soldiers, but if, no matter how good a soldier you are, if you're where the high explosive shell lands, mm 
uh, doesn't matter what nationality you are, you're, you're still going to be obliterated. Um, uh, and uh, so uh, but I do mythologize the Liberty a little bit. Yeah. You do a little bit, but it sort of, it's, it almost invites, well, it certainly invites it to coming from the perspective of Australia because, because of this encounter with the larger world and, and the way in which the encounter come, came to define yes. a very sort of spread apart, amorphous identity. But also, even the, there's something mythic about the two sisters, two young sisters, who, who's, who sign up for a volunteer army and set sail, and they find themselves, there are all sorts of mythic resonances. They find themselves, for example, in the wine dark sea. They're going by, they're on a Greek island at, at one point, um, and they're sunk in the water. And they're, and they're sunk. And that, there is, there is an extraordinary set piece of about 40 pages of the sinking of the hospital ship in which, in which they're on. And there's an amazing moment where one of the nurses who they think is lost pops up, and I won't say which one, pops up holding onto the mane of a, of a pony on the hospital ship. There were... Um, there were horses and donkeys to pull cannons and things like that, and she pops up, and it's and it is it is a, an image straight out of a Greek myth. You know? it, it is, isn't it? And it happened. The, it really the ship happened. was called the Marquette, and the British got the great idea of sending out on this Australian instead of sending the ship out empty and then collecting wounded and bringing them back. Let's send a regiment. It was an Irish regiment, Malachy, but not of your political complexion. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, uh, the, because of the troops on board, the, the Germans sink it. And it's full of horses. It's, full of, it's a horrible scene in a way, but writers are ruthless. It's, it's, these horses drowning. And in reality, there was a nurse who was drowning and descending, and she'd given her life up. And a horse rose beneath her, an artillery horse, who reached a depth even lower and started ascending again. And she sort of hung on to its mane uh, and bestrode its flanks <coughs> as well as she could. And she rose to the surface on a horse. Mm -hmm. And that's, you know, sometimes reality it manages to be more mythic and more wonderful Absolutely. than uh, and more uh, uncanny uh, yes that's right so but it, it's also a novel it's important to say outside of this carapace of history it's also a novel it seems to me of temperament and the way in which one is tempered that, and that there are all sorts of different kind, different aspects of temperament. There is one's individual temperament. There is the temperament of a family. There is this, the two nurses, the Durant sisters, are considered somewhat aloof. And that, so there is a, an aspect of their temperament that is not, um, at least initially, considered, uh, uh, they, they are considered somewhat outside of the, the small community mm. in which they find themselves. And then, of course, their temperaments, they have a temperament between each other, which, is, which only through war comes to, it comes to amount to, to friendship. So I wonder what, what your thoughts are about the ways in which you wanted to explore notions of, of personal yes. temperament. Uh, sisters have uh, always interested me, you know, how uh, polar they are to each other at the same time, how close. And the sister, these sisters are both attracted to each other and draw, driven apart by the fact that they have uh, collaborated, it appears, in their mother's mercy killing. And now uh, they are trying to put that death in the context of a rising tide of damaged young men. And um, uh, I, I, look, I don't know how you manage to do, one manages to do this stuff, if, if indeed it is good. Because as you know, a lot of the um, 
writing of a novel and working out how people are going to react, react to each other is instinctual. Sure. But there's a scene I did, like sometimes when you're writing, you think, that, boy, that's a good scene. <laughs> you know, that's going to uh, make the, you know, that's, a, you're often wrong, of course. <laughs> uh, but the scene where they try, after they've been to Gallipoli and come back, they, they try to make friends of each other in a, um, in a cafe, cafe in, Alexandria. in Alexandria, in a palm court. Uh, and they're, they're further aloof, not just by temperament, but by the fact that if they ever got close to anyone, they'd have, no, they'd have to confess what happened with their mother. And one of them uh, becomes very interested and becomes the lover of a young Australian infantryman who encounters the Impressionists and wants to be a painter. And he's amazed that um, between Paris, uh, the Louvre Museum, Notre Dame, all the rest of it, and the body impregnated, um, gas impregnated, rat infested trenches, there's only 70 or 80 miles. It's the glory of Europe and the horror of Europe jammed in together. I'm sorry this is booming a bit, um, uh, but um, in any case, um, well, there is also that she feels she has to tell him uh, yes. if she gets any closer. And so the intimacies of the novel uh, are delayed by the act they've taken part in. Uh, I don't know how I work that stuff out. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Well, you some know, of that I is sort of a trope in fiction, you know, that er early on a novel where a death happens very early on, then there is an aspect of the rest of the novel that is almost the mending of that rent, mm. right? But what happens in The Daughters of Mars, certainly there is a mending of that rent between the two sisters, but the whole rest of the world is torn, torn open. Yes. You know, it's, um, yes. It, the, the carnage is extraordinary, and the, and the, the level of research and, and the um, appalling, frankly, detail detail after detail piling on of, of what these women were expected, 22, 23, 24 year old women were expected to um, cope with and in fact did cope with. So there is a, there's a sense also too of their stoicism, their uncomplaining stoicism. Yes, and, that... Uh... And you read, this was based on diaries, war diaries that, that you had read yourself. I'm very interested in women's coping um, they only go crazy over relatively unimportant matters, <laughs> like, like divorce, for example. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I was with my wife, I've never I've told my cousins who were here this story, but we encountered one night, I, I was making a documentary for London Weekend Television uh, in Eritrea, I've been there before, I didn't really want to go back because I'm a wimp. Uh, I should have been born somewhere else but Australian. I'm such an uncharacteristic Australian male. But anyhow, uh, we um, uh, came upon one night in Eritrea in 1989, uh, a, a woman, a, a group of nomads who waved the truck down and uh, our camera crew was in it and Judy and uh, Eritrean died, and there was uh, uh, um, there were a number of camels that the nomads owned, and in a satchel on the side of one was a girl of 15 who some days before had trodden on a Russian landmine. Mm -hmm. Now her injuries were unspeakable, um, and she, uh, Judy, um, yet the sound man and I in particular disgraced ourselves. We were behind thorn trees vomiting because she was in a terrible condition. And uh, any, anyhow, uh, uh, Judy set to work on her and we loaded her in the truck and took her to a rotor, which was the hospital um, dug into the mountains. And um, Judy, the sound man was wiped out totally. And so, um, Judy did the sound and acted as scout nurse around the mm -hmm. perimeter of the operating theatre. And um, 
uh, it was a perfect lesson in how women can cope. And these young women, what was interesting is that Sally, who ends up in a casualty clearing station, uh, she and her fellow nurses deal with the convoy every two or three nights, and they process them over two days. And there's uh, gas injury, men whose, um, young men whose, uh, the membranes of whose uh, esophagus and lungs have been burned away. And they, the nurses all said they look the most panicked, always the most panicked. And they're, they're shell shock. There's dysentery. There are people with limbs blown off. Um, there's um, burns. There's um, uh, thoracic wounds, abdominal wounds. And there's light wounds. And over two days, they process them so that um, the, uh, many of the men with wound shock would, um, their diastolic would meet their systolic, and that was the end of them. And there are scenes in which Sally is uh, checking on the diastolic and systolic. Uh, uh, and um, uh, they can do this three, four times, five times a fortnight. And deal with this range of damage concentrated into young men's flesh. And not only that, they didn't know the war was going to end in 1918. So anyone who was up there, a brother, a lover, they knew he was going to end up like this. At best, like this. Because everyone At best, seemed to be... Even in a war. Yes. Yeah. And they thought the war would go on to the 1920s because the Russians had just pulled out. And um, so uh, even knowing that everyone they knew, including their little brothers at home, were going to end up in this Mensa, they were able to handle it. And the only nurse who has a crack up has a crack up over a fiancé uh, who is um, uh, killed and is obviously killed, but she won't believe it. And like Constable fixating on the, the rumours about him, she fixated on, on the fact that she wrote him a love letter and there might now be German orderlies laughing at this love letter. Uh, and she, we know there's no love letter left. We know there's no, no him left. Uh, we know he's been obliterated, but she won't face it and, and she collapses for a time. Right. But even when she's under, she is under a delusion about that, she's still nursing. Right, it, there's this tremendous sense of, to be useful, to be of use in yeah. the face of, and but set, set up all the way through with the exception of say the orderly Kiernan who is a, who is a Quaker, um, there is this contrast always between what that the, the women can actually manage and cope, but also do something effective, and and the men are just being sent off to destroy and, or be destroyed, mm -hmm. and in this sort of constant chain. But there's another aspect of the novel that almost is like a wounds a wounds eye view of of history. Yeah, you know what? And I read somewhere, in, maybe it was in your um, memoir, that when you were a boy. There was a family friend that you knew, and he very self-deprecatingly described a wound that he had suffered uh, on the Western Front, whereby he had a wound in his side, and they poured boiling mercury. Yeah, they cauterized it with mercury. Mm. And he fainted, but he was telling you this story as if yes. if he were if he had been tougher. He wouldn't have fainted. Yes, that's so, right. So, I mean, I don't know how old you were, maybe a teenager. I was about maybe 16. 16. Yeah, it must have had a tremendous impression and on you. And this bloke was an Irish Australian called Downey. I went to school with his son, who was blind. Mm. Um, and, uh, yeah, tough. Uh, they were tough then. I wonder about the whole the, the whole perspective of history in, in, ter in terms of sort of medical history, in fact, even. And at one point when I was reading the section when, the, when they are on the Western Front and the men are coming back gassed, of course, what was happening in Syria was, was going on simultaneously. And I wonder, so much, so many of your novels, virtually all of your novels, 
had used this carapace of history to crawl inside. And and that's here we are. That's because I can't plot anything. Well, that's what. <laughs> <laughs> I can't plot to say. You know where the plot's going. <laughs> that's that's exactly. the arc of history. <laughs> yes, that's right. <laughs> but do you also have this sense that you land on a moment in history, and then and there's this quality of the return of it in some sense? Yes, yes. Um, I, I think of it more about what I felt was an imperative behind every novel. There is a delusion about the imperative nature of the material, that this novel has to be written. Mm -hmm. Most of us are wrong about that, but there is a grand <laughs> infatuation that drives the novel. If there wasn't a sort of infatuation, there wouldn't be a novel. Um, and um, uh, infatuation, as I, to repeat what I just said, is, is very unreliable, but it's very important <laughs> for getting the novel uh, written, and I think of it in, in, in those terms. So history is your infatuation? Yes, not, not uh, absolutely. I, I, uh, I make up stuff like blazes, but I don't make up any of the damage or the... the I don't make up that stuff. I make up the relationships sure, between people. Of course. Like the glacial relationship between... I mean, this book shouldn't be read by anyone because it takes to about page 400 before anyone has sex. That's <laughs> true, but that becomes part of what's important to the course, plot anyway. Yeah. Because they, yeah. they lose any interest in... I mean, it's almost as if there's just this very faint heartbeat, live, 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 underneath, and that's all they're mm -hmm. trying to do. The idea that you would want to have sex with somebody, and one of the very interesting details, which I'm sure is true, is that the women stopped menstruating. The nurses yes. in, in the theatres of war stopped menstruating. And that happened, happens in, uh, it, it happened in Eritrea, mm -hmm. so with Eritrean true. women who were uh, both warriors and involved in medicine, and even in back areas. Uh, and it happened during World War II in various places like Holland, where there's, it happens in famines. It happened in the Irish famine, happened in the Bengali famine, happened in the Ethiopian famine. Uh, and um, it's um, something, I, I think it's a remarkable mechanism. Yeah. Most of nature doesn't work and <laughs> we die. Uh, but uh, this is a case of nature working. Mm to making sure that children are conceived and born in intolerable situations. But it is important to say that there is some sex, and there is certainly <laughs> love that it happens later. Well, Lady Tartan, who's an English aristocrat, and, uh, and uh, my old friends from the Nine First Fridays Club uh, in New York know that uh, I don't carry a huge flame for the... Um, English aristocracy. <laughs> <laughs> Lady, Lady Tartan uh, is based on Lady Dudley. And Lady Dudley is based on, uh, I found out about, from her great-granddaughter, Rachel Ward, who's married to Brian Brown, an Australian actor. And Brian Brown's the sort of Australian that a well-bred English girl marries to get even with her parents. <laughs> uh, and, uh, but Rachel Ward told me about her granny, who started the Bush Nursing Service, uh, Lady Dudley. And, you know, in those days, women did such things against the will of men, against the will of the patriarch. Uh, maybe it's the same now. And Lady Dudley's idea to start an Australian voluntary hospital in Boulogne and nurse Australians, but they also ended up nursing others be, because the casualties were always... Uh, yes, that's right, the casualties up front were always underestimated. Uh, and the wounded used to say to each other in, in, in ambulances, try to get into Lady Dudley's Australian Voluntary Hospital because they serve more booze there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, because they serve more booze, the hospital was looked down upon, but it, mm. it, it was a triumph. Mm. And sadly, Lady Dudley suicided at, 
after the war was set. But um, you can see what she looked like by looking at Rachel, who was a very handsome, so she must be uh, a very handsome good. woman and a great gift to Australia because Rachel's doing stuff in Australia uh, of the kind, as well as directing films and acting in films. She's doing, uh, she's involved in NGOs and charities that are doing the same sort of work her great grandmother did. And I think the relationship between her and the one-legged Tasmanian matron, Mitchie, mm -hmm. and a dairy farmer's da daughter from the Maclay Valley, mm -hmm. uh, there's an interest, inevitably, yes. Yes. you know, I didn't know how it would work out, but even when I knew there was going to be such a relationship, I thought you ought to be able to, even you ought to be able to do something with this. Well, you know, but, it, but you, I mean, you do it very well in that there is, it's psychologically, You've got to they, say that. No, I don't. <laughs> no, but psychologically, they, they recognize each other. They, there's, there's something, mm. and in, in fact, even in the tribe of nurses, there, there is a recognition amongst all of them. And that's, I think, yes. that's one of the, you say you don't plot very well, but that is absolutely one of the things that carries you through a lack of romance or a lack of whatever in various very, you know, very difficult traumatic um, scenes which are masterly. I mean, they're just they're very profound, but it's hard going in terms of what it is you're what it is you're actually reading. And in fact, what sustains you is this um, is this bond between all of the characters between this, this little tribe yes. of nurses and how they persisted. Now I wanted to ask you something about the diaries in which you were, were reading it, and because there's something structural about that that must have suggested itself to you because you have refrained from a tr traditional punctuation. So on the one hand it actually reads, in a, it makes it actually read very almost modern, more modern than its moment because it's not punctuated and it increases the intimacy I think the fact that the dialogue is not punctuated I'm just wondering about that as a choice that that's a sort of uh, to use that kinky French term homage <laughs> to uh, the journals and the diaries um, I, I noticed when I started reading I have at home my uncle, my eldest uncle's letters from the uh, Western Front. And they are all dashes instead of um, commas. And people then could write, people who got to sixth grade were generally, a lot of them were very well educated and, and could write a narrative, but their punctuation was wrong. Mm -hmm. And they also used capital letters for abstract nouns, like uh, support, capital letter, mm -hmm. you know. Uh, but um, uh, I noticed that that happened with some of the nurses too, and stretcher bearers. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I thought, <coughs> I'll do it. It seems to flow. Absolutely. Um, the editors will make me change it, but I'll do it for now. <laughs> and they didn't make me change it. Yeah. Because they're gentlemen and women at uh, Simon and Schuster. <laughs> <laughs> I think they didn't make a change it because it works so well. You know, it creates a kind of an internal because it's it, it's on it's it's omniscient. But first, I mean, even the those that choice of the the position of the point of view, which shifts from Sally and goes in and out of omniscient, that it, that was an interesting decision. And is that something that you arrived at when you began? It's so funny, I don't know about you, but I make the decision about first or third person, omniscient uh, narrator and, and intimate experiencer of events, <laughs> uh, almost instinctively. Mm, right. well, you the, same, the same place that uh, names come from. Mm. You, you don't, I, I find I don't spend a lot of time making up names. Mm. The, the, they, sort of arise. Do you think that that's what and history provides you with in the, in the sort of plot, plot, and the history provides you these signposts, and that almost liberates you? Yes, you that's know, right. To, to, to just yes. really unconsciously yes. move within these pillars of, 
fixed yeah. event. Uh, history's the skeleton, and you can make a, uh, a every time you touch it, you can make a different body out of it. And uh, it's the making of the body that's the fiction, I suppose. Um, but you've written many non-fiction narratives also too, and so do you begin one with a decision that it's a novel, or that it, or does that yes. happen sometimes? Novels are very well suited, I find, to things like, instead of, you know, you write a history of the Holocaust, you write a faction or a documentary novel about someone like Schindler, who's on the periphery, who is a sedate and German, who is a small industrialist, uh, who is, um, through whom you establish an intimate connection with individual survivors. And similarly with this, um, I, I would never write a novel about a general who's making the history. I would like, in, in a sense they're making the history, but also the wheel of history, the great wheel is rolling over them as well. Uh, and the novel is very good for people on the periphery, not for the king, but for the person who changes his shirt or his underpants or whatever. For the, 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 both the actor and sufferer of, in history, uh, they are in a small way making history, but not in the huge way. They, uh, and the, the novel is made for the person on the edge. And you can't get more the edge than the Maclay Valley in New South That's Wales, right. yeah. where these girls come from. Right. You're right, I mean, and Australia at the end of the earth. Um, but then the gift of the novel is then that an exploration of a self, like Sally, when she has a moment where she actually sort of feels like she had lost herself after she's yeah. she's dr almost drowned and been rescued, and she it's almost as if another mind is sort of bobbing in hers. That would never be that would never be authentic if you had if you were using an historical figure. If it was your Napoleon that you were inhabiting, yes. that Napoleon was losing his sense of self for a moment. You know, it's not. It doesn't have the same he, he credibility. Didn't. He didn't have uh, ever lose his sense of self, but he was at the same time uh, a succession of selves. Mm -hmm. And Sally finds, uh, believes that there was a Sally who drowned instead of surviving. Right, yeah, yeah. And she believes, you might remember an incident when she's escorting uh, a, a wounded man from the, what are they called, the receiving tent, mm -hmm. where they work out which ward people are going to be sent right. to. And one of these small, intimate little bombs dropped from a German yes. fight bomber, and, and uh, everyone around her, including the patient, is obliterated. And she thinks there's a Sally who died then. Mm. And so she feels that she is not a She's almost a series of persons who survived <coughs> rings on a pole. Rings on a pole, yes. Yeah. And the Sally of the Maclay Valley is not the Sally of Lemnos, <coughs> where the women are so badly treated, an island off Greece, mm -hmm. where the wounded were treated and the women were treated badly. Uh, she is a she is a different person at each stage, and I think we are uh, yes, different people and. And I think there are parallel universes where we different things happen to us. And the novel is an ideal place to explore them. That reminds me, though, of the of I don't I don't want to give anything away for the novel, but there is a bifurcated ending, rather like reminded me of Great Expectations, how there there are, were essentially two endings or two outcomes, and in a sense, it's up to the reader which. To yes, al in. although one is clearly yes. identifies itself as the actual. But that grows out of Sally's idea of parallel mm -hmm. uh, developments, of there being an influenza mm -hmm. epidemic in which Sally dies and an influ influenza epidemic through which Sally lives and marries her artist Condon. Mm -hmm. 
Conlon's got this great idea. I'm sorry. I'm, no, that's go ahead. Little, no, go ahead. Conlon's got this great idea. He encounters the impressionists and he thinks they're sunk. They've got all the talent, but it's sunk up here in, in the gloom of Northern Europe. So what we're going to do somehow is get the Impressionists and Australia together. Because Australia's <laughs> got all the light and none of the talent. And they've got all the gloom, uh, no light and all the, all the talent up here. Uh, and so uh, that's his big dream, to get those two well, together. It was a lovely touch because, you know, it was, it was a, the sense of somebody actually surviving, not just surviving, but surviving to, to return and to change something fundamentally. Mm. Uh, in a, yeah, in, in, in an artistic in, uh, 